Welcome everyone. This is DJ Wells from the Mensa Research Institute and from Mensa Medical. And thank you for joining us for our third installment of a webinar to talk about the COVID-19 pandemic and ways to boost your immune health um, as we uh, as we look to navigate this pandemic. Uh, we've had a couple of discussions uh, over the past two weeks with Dr. Albert Mensa and with Samantha Gilbert. Uh, they've shared some great insights on things that we can be doing to boost our immune health as a first line of defense against the pandemic. Um, several of you have sent in some outstanding questions that uh, Dr. Mensa and Samantha have had an opportunity to, to respond to, and that's the case uh, here again this week. Uh, we ask you to use the Q&A function there on the webinar to send in your questions, and first we're going to let Dr. Mensa and Ms. Gilbert share a little bit. Uh, I think, as, as I recall from last week, they said that they were going to speak a little bit about uh, uh, boosting our children's immune health and 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 dealing with things for our our, our young people, um, and so we'll let them go for you know 30, 40 minutes and and share some specific insights along those lines, and then during that time, please submit your questions using that Q and A function on the webinar tool here and. Uh, I'll come back in in about 30, 40 minutes and begin to read to Dr. Mensa and to Mrs. Gilbert uh, the questions that you all are submitting and we'll get those answered for you live. Uh, we're scheduled to go 60 minutes, but as we did last week, we had so many great questions that um, we continued on for an additional 30 and we'll do the same again this week uh, as needed. So get your questions in we'll get them answered. Uh, and without further ado, we'll, we'll turn it over to Dr. Mensa and Ms. Gilbert to get us started on this conversation about boosting immune health, specifically as it relates to our kids and certainly uh, as it relates to all the rest of us as well. So uh, Sammy, Dr. Mensa, take it away. Thank you, Mr. Wells. Uh, first of all, I wanna say thank you so much, Samantha. Um, your insights are just amazing. Folks, if you don't know Samantha Gilbert, uh, she's a, a quite a skilled nutritional consultant and expert, and she understands biochemical imbalances, and she helps individuals to eat for their chemistry. Um, what is so significant about this time is that we've very well forgotten or underestimated the role of good nutritional health in supporting immune health and uh, immune function. In other words, just staying healthy. And so that's the purpose of our discussions uh, for this set of weeks here, the last two, and then today, and then the next one to follow. Samantha and I, um, we're going to be talking this time around with regard to more so pediatric issues, including autism and a variety of other things. Now, of course, this topic is so huge that we couldn't possibly cover all the major pieces, but um, Samantha is going to go over some very key points that I think you're going to really appreciate, and we'll chime in a bit here from the medical side, and together I think it'll be fabulous. So. Samantha, um, I want to thank you so much for, for coming and, and sharing this time. Um, I've got a very strange side note that I'm just going to start with first. Uh, this is totally unplanned, but I've been very, very distraught by the recent deaths of two infants that we've seen from the uh, COVID virus. The one was only six weeks old, and the other one was uh, nine months old. And that's very disturbing to me. It's disturbing for a lot of people, but I also want to share with you something many of you don't know. Uh, when I was initially going to medical school, I wanted to be a pediatrician. And I just loved kids. And that was a very, very uh, soft area for me. So, you know, many of you already do this, but I'm just gonna say, listen, your children don't have any immune function of their own up until six months of age. So if, you're, if you really haven't thought about it um, and you've got an infant breastfeed, if you can't breastfeed, pump and give that milk to your child unless there's a severe sensitivity, because that's where the baby's getting its immune protection from. Baby's getting it from you, mom. So do your best to do well. And now I'm going to segue to Samantha. Um, let's talk. Mm. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Mensa. I'm, I'm honored to be here. I'm honored to be a part of this with you and Mensa Medical. Uh, and one thing that I would like to add to the critical nature of breastfeeding, and again, in some instances, uh, that is um, difficult to do, but not only are you giving your child their immune system, but it's a huge bonding time with your baby. Oxytocin is released during that time, and it create, that's a bonding hormone, and it's creating that connection, that affect regulation that you have with your child. So I just wanted to add that. That's kind of what came to my mind when you were sharing that. And also, I think that helps kick off this conversation um, with regard to digestion. I think we're, you know, we're going to go back to kind of last week. We touched on a lot of things, but especially in children, we're seeing so much impairment in the immune system because of what kids are eating and what's going on in their guts. And one thing that's really interesting that I've always found interesting ever since I, I went to college to study nutrition is that digestion really starts in the brain. If you think about it, as human beings, as creatures of habit, we're drawn to a variety of foods. And even the, the thought of having a pizza, our favorite pizza, or our favorite chocolate bar, or ice cream. For me, when I was struggling with an eating disorder, it was Ben and Jerry's and Oreo cookies. Now I can't stand them <laughs> because I overdid it. But we're drawn to certain foods, and that process starts in our brain. But unfortunately, our food supply has become so perverted, and that is honestly the best uh, term that I can use uh, or descriptor that I can use to, to describe what's going on in our world and what our kids are eating, that our taste buds and therefore our brains and our guts and everything else has changed dramatically. So we no longer know what really tastes good and what doesn't because the chemicals in these foods are directing that for us. And I see it with so many families, you know, I have moms coming to me crying, well, what do I feed my kid? My child has a disability uh, or is, you know, has some kind of impairment, whether it's a behavioral disorder, autism, ADHD, uh, you know, OCD, eating disorders are huge right now amongst our, our young people. And there's just so much confusion about what to eat. Um, and I want to kick off this conversation, and Dr. Mensa, please jump in, with how are you, or, or I, want to, I want to pose the question, how, how does your family relate to one another? How do you handle stress together? Um, and, you know, and Dr. Mensa, you and I had a great conversation as we were preparing for this. And I'm just curious if you wouldn't mind kind of stepping in here a bit and helping kick off this conversation about the family unit. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because of the times that we're in now, how we've kind of grown apart while within the same space. Um, many people may not watch this, but most people know about The Simpsons. And there was an, an interesting uh, dynamic between two senior citizens in, this, in a Simpsons episode. One was Mr. Burns, one was his girlfriend. And they were lying in bed together, both of them engrossed on an iPad. And the conversations kind of went like, Mm, mm, okay, mm -hmm, interesting, okay, and nobody's paying any attention. Well, now we're thrust into a different scenario where we're all sort of together and there's an interesting opportunity here. This is a severe learning point for us. We're learning to reconnect or we're choosing to get into trouble either way. It could be a problem or there can be a great benefit. So kind of revisiting what we do together, how we relate to ourselves, to our children, and it's a great reflective time as well. Why do I do the things that I do? Why is my wife upset? What, you know, in other words, what did I do to produce that if you're the husband? And sometimes in the reverse, how are we really handling the family dynamic? It's a great time to sort of think about those things and create something new. It's an awesome time for family relationships and dynamics to totally blossom and to help get back to what it is that we were designed to do before. And we know that with most social gatherings, food is involved, all right? So here we are with an opportunity to look at those things that we do, why we do them, and to bring our kids into some wonderful discussions about, you know what, maybe that's not so good for you. And why do you want to really eat that? Do we really need to? I'll be honest with you, my own daughter, so I'm telling on myself now, okay? My own daughter sat back and I, I said something to her a long time ago. I said to her, 
you know, she wanted ice cream. This is like four or five years ago. And I said to you, honey, you know what? Um, we don't eat to please our taste buds. Food is designed to be pleasurable so that we actually eat. We're supposed to consume good foods. And I said, don't eat to please your taste buds. Well, let's fast forward four or five years. Um, I'll admit it, I ordered a pizza and I was about to chow down on my favorite deep dish pizza with all the sausage and everything. And my, my little one, I call her my baby. She said to me, dad, what are you doing? And I said, uh, I'm, 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 I'm gonna eat this food so that you don't have to, is what I said. <laughs> and she said, daddy, you're not supposed to eat to please your taste buds. You're supposed to eat properly. And I said, oh my goodness, train too well. But already we're looking to, to really sort of imbue our children with good understanding and good habits that later on they're gonna throw back in your face when you stray. So keeping each other in check is gonna be a great thing. But it's really a great time for us to kind of revisit the entire dining experience, the cooking experience, the preparation experience, the shopping experience, well, not so much shopping, but the choices that we make. This is a great time for us to be able to talk about that. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Dr. Mensah. That, that's, <laughs> that's an excellent illustration of so many dynamics that I see in families today. And I think, and this is for all of us, this is for myself too, we often go on autopilot and we just don't think or realize how we're interacting and how, um, you know, what we say and, and again, the kind of foods that we choose and how we're being together as a family, how that's trickling down into the younger generations, you know, kind of going back to digestion starting in the brain. Well, whenever there's a lot of processed foods being eaten, one of the questions that I get asked is, how am I supposed to do this? My child is you know throwing a major temper tantrum they're angry they're extremely irritable they're yelling at me when i'm trying to change their diet well what do i do well you know it takes about 30 days for things to shift and for cravings to go away and i'm not saying that it takes that long for the cravings to actually go away but 30 days is generally that time frame where new habits and new patterns become more of a lifestyle and that's what i specialize in our lifestyle modifications. So how can we come together as a family? You know, I mentioned before, I, I think I've mentioned this in the past couple of episodes, but I wanna, you know, stress it again, coming together in the kitchen, cooking together, that whole experience starts long before you put food in your mouth. So I just, I wanna encourage you parents that even though there's a, a, there's a huge learning curve in the beginning, and again, I know this is review, um, hang in there, hang in there, because your child is eventually going to feel better. They're going to realize, oh gosh, when I eat this candy bar, this Hershey's bar, I feel this way. When I have, uh, you know, a wholesome meal with maybe some chicken and some squash and some other veggies, maybe some good fat thrown in there, I notice that I feel better. I'm not so irritable. I'm sleeping better. I'm able to focus better on my homework and interact with my friends, that's a huge one, a huge selling point, interact with my friends in a different way. I'm more present with my friends. Um, so I that, think that, I'm sorry. If I may, yeah. you know, one thing that we do want to emphasize that even though the habit curve is about um, uh, 30 days, your kids will comply within five days. Yes, five wonderful you. days of having nothing except good foods to eat, they will eat no matter what kind of, don't worry about them starving. It's not going to happen, mom and dad. That's all I just wanted to say. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because I know that it's it's hard to parent a child that has a lot of behavioral disorders um, or, or has a specific behavioral disorder and is just out of control. And it's something that we see all the time. So we get it. Our hearts go out to you. But as Dr. Mensa shared, that will subside. There might be that initial upset, but that will subside. Uh, some things that you can do are to just not keep those foods in the house. And I totally appreciate that you have other children and there are other people in the house, but I do wanna encourage that if you all do this together and come together as a cohesive unit, it makes things so much better for that child. Now, does that mean you can never have um, you know, sweets or treats? Sure you can. Um, but there are things that you can do. For example, you can take each child out individually and spend time with them individually and, you know, plan something in that, in that 
regard so that they're getting that attention and maybe while you're out you'll get a treat together and have that special one-on-one -on -one time there are so many things that can be done to, to help kind of modulate and bring that into fruition in a way that is healthy and beneficial for everyone involved um, and I think uh, Dr. Mensa I sure love you to you know to add to that but I want to not forget um, that we also see things go the other direction where there's too much of an emphasis on um, uh, you know consulting Dr. Google and you know focusing on oh I have to get rid of oxalates I have to worry now about histamine and now I have to worry about free glutamates and you know it just becomes too much too overwhelming too much information and that also leads into a lot of stress and that stress will have a significant impact not only on the family unit but also on everyone's digestive capacity. So, uh, Dr. Mensa, did you want to add add to that? Yeah, you know, one of the things we try to emphasize is, look, let's focus on the things that create major change. Now, there are some people out there who are sensitive to oxalates, but the vast majority of you really are not, okay, in terms of your kids and, and the change that's going to occur in autism. And it's a huge struggle. Your children basically won't eat much of anything, okay, if that's the case. But here's the real deal. Many of the, the foods that contain oxalates also contain phenols. And for a significant number of children in the autism spectrum, it's actually the phenols they're sensitive to. And here's an easy thing. A product called no phenol. We call it no phenol, but N-O-P-H-E-N-O-L, no phenol. Give it to your child when they're eating these foods. And guess what? If they don't react while they're taking that product, then the odds are they're not actually having difficulties with oxalates, it's phenols. And that has a really powerful effect. So you, you want to get this right. You don't want to spend time, energy, and money in areas where it's not really warranted or where it's going to do any good. Um, there are lots of things that you can do you know, right away to really sort of categorize where the real sensitivities are that are going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and off, thank you, Dr. Mensa. And often along those lines, when the diet is cleaned up before they even start, their nutrients, you know, whenever they're coming to you, Dr. Mensa, and, and you know, I'm, I'm working with them dietarily. Cleaning up the diet first is really a critical step because as I shared in, in the last episode, what happens when we start putting nutrients into the body when there's a lot of processed foods happening is that that detox process can be, um, it can be overwhelming, it depends on the individual. But the nice thing about diet is that it allows the nutrients to be absorbed better by the body because the digestive capacity is greater. Um, you know, we've eliminated a lot of inflammation already with diet alone, which is very, very powerful. And that, in, in, in a sense, preps the body for therapeutic levels of nutrients that Dr. Benza and, and Dr. Bowman would be uh, prescribing. So this is a great time, again, as we're kind of sequestered here and there's so much fresh produce available. There's, there's, you know, I mean, I've been going to the store once per week and still noticing an abundance of fresh produce. This is the best time really to start this process with the diet. And then by the time, if you are a patient or if you're going to be a patient at Mensa Medical, by the time you, you work with them and you get your protocol, you're gonna be in a really, really good place. And again, that 30 day period is so powerful because so much can be done in that time. Um, so I think that that's another thing that, that I think is a really critical piece to this, you know, to, to what we're talking about here. Um, and, you know, Dr. Mensa, you and I were also talking a lot about just neurotransmitters in general and how they affect our digestive capacity. Most people don't realize that dopamine and norepinephrine and serotonin specifically play a, a, a big role in the digestive process. Um, in fact, a lot of people that on, are, are on um, SSRIs or, or antidepressant medications often find that when they start those medications, they might, be, uh, might have diarrhea initially. And then as the body um, kind of acclimates to that medication and higher doses are implemented, often they notice that they're more constipated. And that's because of the role that serotonin plays in uh, peristalsis, which, which is basically muscular contractions that happen in the GI tract that get your food from one place to the other. And as I shared last week, that starts in the mouth. So we have enzymes in our mouth, 
that chewing, I talked about mechanical digestion, that chewing process that's really, really important that a lot of people don't do or think about. Um, that whole process is, is starting there. And with that, you know, with that motion and with that movement, we need those important neurotransmitters for that to happen. And that's another reason why uh, upgrading your diet to more whole foods can be so terribly powerful because so many, so many of our kids are, are severely constipated or ha have diarrhea, right, Dr. Mensa? Absolutely, or have severe digestion. Gosh, Sammy, you know, this is interesting. Let's go through a hypothetical from start to the GI tract here of, of taking in food. If you happen to have a biochemical imbalance, so let's just say you're depressed and you're, you're low in serotonin, so you, you take an SSRI and you're talking about the, the whole issue with um, SSRIs, like serotonin production uh, and so forth. But let's talk about a bad food you're eating, not a healthy food. And why don't you go ahead and start with that again with the serotonin and we'll chime in as we move through the esophagus and the GI tract and what's actually happening now when your lovely child is taking in a McNugget. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. And, and you know, we'll, we'll tie this into, uh, you know, kind of the biochemical piece. I know some people in our first episode were asking, you know, I mentioned undermethylation. I also shared my story. Um, and I want to tie this in with undermethylation because in undermethylators, as I shared, we're low in serotonin, dopamine, and nor epinephrine. So, um, so if, if for, you know, again, I like to use myself as an example because I have no problem sharing my story, have no shame in that. But when I was really struggling with an eating disorder and my cravings were, you know, all over the place because of my, you know, a lot, a lot of that had to do with, um, my GI imbalances, but, but again, serotonin and dopamine being low, um, you know, I always wanted to go to the sweets, you know, dopamine is that pleasure and reward hormone. So those sweets were so powerful to me. And that again, going back to digestion starting in the brain. So I had this powerful um, draw to all of these foods, but then when I, when I would eat them, I would get an initial high, if you will, um, initial spike, and then, of course, I would crash a couple of hours later. So that's a good example of someone like myself and many of the people that we serve um, where we have those deficiencies and those neurotransmitters. We get an initial spike with a very, very high sugary or high carb food. And then what happens later, you know, that the crash starts. So Dr. Mensa, can you share more with us about what's yes. really going on with that process? So after we, we spike our insulin levels, which cause our, our glucose to, to go running into our cells, the problem is insulin doesn't let you release energy from those same cells. So you become low energy, hypoglycemic, and the cycle starts all over again. You go to grab the first sugary thing you can find, but here's the problem. Now you're also creating inflammation. So while this process of struggling to move food down your esophagus from your throat to your stomach, it's very, very difficult. Now you're getting inflamed, and now the acidity in your stomach is going to start to do its thing, but that, there are gonna be problems there too. And so now enzyme function or enzyme dysfunction starts to happen, and some people get dyspepsia. They may actually have acid reflux because of it. And then as things start to move from the stomach to the GI tract, the small intestine, now absorption issues happen if you've got a leaky gut, which many of you already know about. But let's tie this in with COVID and, and it, actually with immune health. Now, if your system is inflamed, all of your cells, your white blood cells, your macrophages, your, your eosinophils, I mean, some of you have eosinophilic esophagitis, okay, that inflammatory thing in your esophagus, okay, all those guys are on hyper alert. And on hyper alert, they're trying to focus in on that element that they recognize as foreign, being, forgive me, the crappy food you're eating or I'm eating. And so now the entire system is sitting there like a fortress without a guard. The walls have been knocked down. So other viruses, other bacteria can come in there into your body and wreak havoc because it's a big shock to the system. The system says, you know what? I was focusing on this over here and now I'm sick. Why is my kid always sick? Why are depressed people always sick? You know, why are, are my kids who's got all these behavioral issues? They just keep getting worse and worse and worse. And now he's got this and this guy, he's got this, he's got this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It becomes a huge domino effect. So it's not as simple as, 
oh gosh, let them just eat that because there's no big deal. You know, one of the things that we talked about a while ago, we did a little video on what happens when you eat carbs, okay? So if you imagine your system as a closed bubble and you eat carbs and then you drink water and if there is yeast present in the system, well, gosh, does that formula sound familiar? You're brewing alcohol. To make beer, every man out there knows it, and I know you're thinking it, you need your, your, your yeast, your barley, your hops, you need sugar, and you need water. So now we've given our kids all the wonderful essential elements for them to be functionally drunk, mm -hmm. okay? And you wonder why their moods are erratic. But they're not only drunk, they're hypoglycemic because their sugar spike and then they dropped. But in all of this, guess what? What's their nutritional status like? They're malnourished. They haven't had an ounce of a single nutrient that is there in order to help protect themselves. One of the reasons why we talk about zinc and vitamin C is because they're key in helping to support immune function, healthy immune function. You have no idea how many, how many, um, how many enzymatic reactions rely on zinc and vitamin C. There's a single reaction that happens in your body that generally doesn't require vitamin C. But now if you're eating all these inflammatory foods, not only are you inflaming the system, you're not giving the system the very tools it needs to help fight against the inflammation, and you become weaker and weaker and weaker. Most of the population here in America actually is malnourished. We are obese. We are swimming in a sea of calories while being tremendously malnourished. Okay? So there are challenges here that go far beyond just the idea of, well, this is just a McDonald's French fry and it tastes good, or gosh, I don't know if you guys heard about the, the young person who lost their vision. They permanently lost their eyesight because they lived on three meals of fast food every day. It was a teenager, 16, 17 year old. They had no vitamin A whatsoever. They lost their eyesight permanently. Normally that's a reversible issue. But these are the kinds of considerations we have to talk about, especially if your child has a behavior disorder or has autism. Uh, the idea here is that these malnutrition pieces combined with inflammation make you highly susceptible to illness, just highly susceptible. And if we're going to protect our kids and our family, we've got to go back to the very beginning and start with, as Samantha said, up here, the brain. Let's think about what we're doing. Absolutely. That was wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Mensa. Um, and that, that reminds me of that whole, uh, you know, stress relationship and how many of our families are in fight and flight constantly and continually. And, you know, a lot of our children are, have copper overload issues. Um, and we know that norepinephrine decreases motility. So that's also another piece here that we often see uh, with our kids. Um, one thing that's heartbreaking to hear is, you know, and, and Dr. Mensa, you and I talked about this, is, you know, a child is constantly on the run. They're going from school to uh, a, an athletic activity to a, you know, some type of academic um, a study group. And then in the evening, there's, there's a, a musical performance. I mean, there's so many things that they have to contend with. And they're going from this to that to this. They're grabbing a McDonald's burger. They're grabbing a milkshake over here, maybe a candy bar. And that's what they're trying to fuel themselves on. And that only works for so long. And then there's, again, this crash. And Dr. Mensa explained beautifully, uh, you know, how and why that's happening. Um, but there's a whole stress piece here with the inflammatory process that we also want to be uh, aware of. And um, if, if everyone's okay with this, this is something that I teach my, uh, my, my clients, I'll often walk people through this process. Um, it's a breathing exercise, and I also do kind of like a, a guided meditation to help them go into a state of relaxation. So we're essentially tricking our nervous system into thinking it's relaxed because we want to make sure that we're balancing, if you will, um, sympathetic and parasympathetic and getting more over into that relaxation mode um, so that we're able to digest our food because that's another reason why we see a lot of digestive problems. Um, that process being impaired often due to all this stress and this going to and fro and then you throw the inflammatory foods on top of that and it's just a recipe for disaster unfortunately and then we wonder why our kids are um, you know, defiant and 
full of rage and, and anger, and then as parents getting angry with our, you know, with our children. So it's kind of this vicious cycle. So just bear so, with me for a moment. What were you going to say, Dr. Mensah? Before you get into that, you brought up something great. You know, this idea of sympathetic versus parasympathetic. One of the big rages now is the discussion around the vagus nerve and vagus nerve stimulation. Well, the thing is you're going through all this, these exercises to try to get vagal nerve stimulation implemented with your child in whatever way, shape, or form. And then you turn around and feed your child all the things that act inhibit the vagus nerve from properly functioning. So that's just one of the things I wanted to bring up. Yeah, thank you. That's that is powerful because it, it it's it, it's definitely um, uh, you know we're seeing more and more about that out there. Um, so this is a simple exercise. It's a breathing exercise, and again, it's tricking your nervous system into thinking it's relaxed. And you're basically just going to inhale for five seconds. So you're gonna inhale and you're gonna hold it for five. So one, two, three, four, and five. And then on the exhale, you're gonna actually um, go a little bit longer. So you're gonna exhale for seven, six, five, four, three, two, and one. And doing that three times, I, I actually ask my clients to do it 10 times before they eat, will prepare your body to absorb the food better. And it's really that simple. And I know that seems kind of, you know, some people go, well, that's silly, that's crazy, but it really does work. So I'm just gonna do it one more time. So inhale for one, two, three, four, and five. And then you're gonna to continue to hold it for one, two, three, four, and five. And then go ahead and exhale for seven, six, five, four, three, two, and one. And that's really it. And you can do this anytime, anywhere. Parents, if you're in a situation where you're ready to blow your lid, because let's be honest, your kid is really bugging you and it's just too much, go into another room, do this breathing exercise, lay on your bed, take a time out. You can always push that pause button. Pushing pause is a powerful way to not only stop, the chaos, but to allow you to go into a space where you can just take 10 minutes for yourself and kind of, again, get back into that more calm state so that in 10 minutes, you can go back out into living in the living room or go back out into the kitchen and be with your family and be present and work through the situation at hand. So just something to think about. And I know that we're getting close to running out of time here and I don't want to um, uh, take up all everyone's time. I wanna make sure that we have enough uh, time to answer questions. Thank you, Samantha. What you did though was very interesting because mechanically you stimulated parasympathetic activity just now. You know, the inhalation process and the holding process actually causes certain receptors in the neck to stimulate parasympathetic activity. And when you're trying to run in the forest from a bear, you're in fight or flight mode, you're not trying to digest. So if you're in fight or flight mode and you're trying to eat dinner, you're gonna have very, very poor digestion. So thank you for that exercise, it was really wonderful. And I, I think we should all really employ that before we eat, especially we come home from a stressful day. Mm -hmm. So um, let's go ahead then and shall we entertain questions at this point? Very good. Thank you. Thanks to both of you for all that great stuff. And I was sitting here um, participating in the in the breathing exercise as you were uh, as you were coaching there, Samantha. And um, I'm I'm feeling uh, feeling in, in a better space here to to take these questions on. And I do want to encourage folks to go ahead and send those questions in. Uh, we've got a couple of folks that have. Uh, been asking questions as as uh, Dr. Mensa and as uh, Ms. Gilvera have been uh, sharing with us, um, but certainly room for lots more. Um, so please do just use that Q and A function to send questions into us, and we'll get them answered as best we can. the The questions that uh, I'm seeing most frequently so far this uh, this afternoon. Um, speak specifically to um, the, the overall topic that we were talking about here, the, the, the idea of um, immune health for our children, specifically as it relates to COVID. 
um, questions about um, some of the stay in place um, directives that that states and that the government have been putting out uh, as it relates to our kids and you know uh, make you know will these stay in in place and shelter in place um, regulations help our kids avoid COVID? Um, should we be engaging our kids in exercise? Should we be taking them outside and having them exercise? And then of course, um, you know, what are the, you know, what are the bad foods other than the McNuggets and French fries that you've talked about um, that will suppress immune health? So uh, if the two of you could talk on those kinds of issues for, for a second. Sammy, could you talk about some of those foods that, that people yeah. don't really recognize are not good for them? Yeah, I, I'm happy to because it's it's interesting how, you know, the, the the all these companies that manufacture processed foods, they're clever. They know how to market to you. They know how to trick you. So it's not so much just the, uh, you know, the cereals and the ice creams, the Oreo cookies that I mentioned earlier, the Ben and Jerry's. We know that stuff is inflammatory. But also, even the gluten-free foods unless you really read labels, I find are very inflammatory. So, you know, I'm proud of you parents for switching to a gluten-free diet. I think that's wonderful. You're doing great. I want to encourage you to read labels because there's often a lot of gluten hidden in a lot of these few foods in the form of preservatives and yeast. And there are things that are called cross-reactive with gluten, um, gliadin molecule, molecule, excuse me, that are cross-reactive like dairy is cross-reactive, corn is cross-reactive, even though it's considered gluten-free, but that's what is used in an abundance of these, what I call junk gluten-free foods. Uh, yeast also, um, which is used in pretty much every processed food uh, you know, that, that's in the supermarket, whether it's whole foods or um, you know, here we have Save Mart and we have Bonds. Um, but I would just be really diligent about reading those labels. And that's why I'm a big fan of more, I guess you would call them paleo products. I don't like labels, but you know, paleo denotes a certain way of eating. So um, I have posted on my Instagram and my Facebook a lot of products that I like, um, crackers that are actually really, really tasty that have no junk in them, no tapioca starch, um, no sugars, no nothing. Um, and, and I can provide those resources, you know, at the end here. But um, Hugh HU is a company that I really like, and they make wonderful crackers. I mentioned uh, Flackers, Flax Crackers. Flackers is the name of the company that makes Flax Crackers. And it's really only a couple of ingredients. So, so parents, what I want you to look out for are very simple ingredients, even in your snacky foods. And we all love a good crunch, okay? We're human. That mastication process is embedded in our DNA. I love me a good cracker, okay? But there are better options. So I think looking at where things hide is the best way for you to go about figuring out what's going to be uh, best for your child. So I, I hope that's helpful. Um, if you're not kosher, by the way, Epic is the name of the brand. They make really good pork rinds and they're from Heritage Pigs. If you eat pork, I know a lot of people don't, so I want to be sensitive here, um, but it's a high quality snack and, you know, they're pork rinds, so that's not going to trigger any blood sugar. They're using sea salt um, and none, none of the other junk. So just just read labels. One of the things that, that I talk about, you know, we, we look at, I hate to say it, pasta, okay? We love our pastas, we love our breads, we love our cereals. All those things are really not the best for your system. Yeah. So when we're, we're talking about, okay, what are inflammatory foods, you know, and forgive me, the, the people I call carpetarians, those who say they're, they're vegetarians, but they're, they're obese, they've got big stomachs, big necks. They're, so where did all this come from? You know, you're not a vegetarian to me. If you, you look that way, something else is going on. You're a carbotarian. You're mm -hmm. trying to fill yourself up with carbs. And guess what? That is far more dangerous than eating, than eating meat could ever be because it's really creating a huge inflammatory cycle in your system. Glucose is spiking, sugar, and, and so forth and so forth. You know the domino effect we've talked about already. You've got to be very conscientious about the, the sneaky carbs, I call them, that is very acceptable as a wonderful meal. 
who doesn't like spaghetti? Who doesn't like lasagna? Who doesn't like all these wonderful things? They're great every now and then. But if you find yourself constantly eating large volumes of these things, these are bad. They are inflammatory. Yes. So watch out for those things. The breads, the pastas, the, the, the lasagnas, all those things that, you know, entire restaurants are designed around. Those are the things you have to be careful for. Okay. That's food. And, yeah. And you can, uh, thank you, Dr. Mensa. I was just going to say a friendly reminder. Most people know this already, but you can get a veggie spiralizer on Amazon for 20 bucks and you can make your own pasta with zucchini, put your red sauce on there. Most people love their red sauce. <laughs> make your meatballs out of your grass-fed protein, and that is a really great meal. I mean, I have that as a dinner often. You can make lasagna with zucchini. You just get a mandolin, it's a kitchen tool, and you thinly slice it, and that will be your lasagna, your pasta layers, when you're making lasagna. So, you know, I said initially, anything that you love that's a junk food, I can give you a substitute, and it will taste just as good, if not better, um, and it's it's going to be so much better for your body and your brain. I think that's the way to go. Talk to Samantha and find out about those substitutes. They yeah. kind of let you think you're eating the, the other stuff, but taste better and they're better for you. I want to talk, though, about some of these questions around sequestration and so forth. Okay. It's a hard topic. But listen, the truth is your job as a parent is to keep your child as safe as possible, to grow them up well, and then to release them into the world. So for right now, yes, indeed, you need to be very protective of your kids. I know they're, they're running around the place, they're bored, they're complaining, they're talking about all sorts of things. Now some areas become very specific. So listen, if you live on five acres of property and there's no one around you uh, within you know, a car driving distance, that's a whole nother scenario. Take your kids out, sure, and get them some fresh air on your property close to the house. Then get back inside, okay? Now, if you live in a congested urban environment, that's a whole nother story, okay? You've got to be as protective as possible against people coming and, and people leaving your home and so forth. It is key. We're only now learning what the real ramifications are and, and capacities of this COVID virus. As I said at the very beginning of this, my heart just went plop when I heard about a six-week-old dying and a six-month-old baby dying. And, you know, when we talk about children who are in their, their teenage years also succumbing to this. Um, why take the risk? You don't want to be that statistic. I'm going to share with you something else that's very interesting. I hope it's, you'll find this interesting. So WGN News in Chicago um, posted a video about uh, folks who are being very cute and they had a dog um, from one home delivering mail to neighbors and delivering foodstuffs and all sorts of things, you know, to the neighbors. And my mouth dropped. I said, wait a minute, you're staying at home so that you can have an animal vector, as we call it, a carrier, actually move from one home to another, and they showed people petting the dog. Mm. And how many of you think that you can pet the dog and not get something? I have news for you, wrong. Any animal is a carrier potential. You have to exercise extreme caution. So it's not a good idea to have Fluffy go to your neighbor's house to give them food or anything else. It is, it is not cute. People can get very sick and not know where it came from. And then there's cross-contamination. Someone pets Muffy, then Muffy comes back home, your kids pet Muffy, then Muffy goes to the other neighbor's house, that neighbor pets Muffy, or gives them a product to be delivered back to you, and all you're doing is absolutely transmitting vectors all over the place. So please, your animals are not simply safe creatures, okay? They've gotta be protected and monitored as well. Do not think that these are benign situations. These are sort of the, the low key ways by which transmission occurs. So yes, you gotta protect the kids. Yes, we're talking about diet. Um, we're also talking about well hydrating. Okay, here's another opportunity where water becomes key. You are made of water, okay? Um, not using ibuprofen. I'm sure some of you have heard this one already. Ibuprofen tends to increase the risk for the viability of this particular virus, okay? So if your kids have a temperature, they're, you know, whatever, Tylenol, I know. Your autism parents are going, wait a minute, Tylenol just, you know, destroys the GI tract, et cetera. Well, listen, we're talking about life or death right now. So you pick your battles. We want your child to be alive, to be able to deal with autism later on, as opposed to simply not being here. 
And I'm not trying to be over dramatic. I want to emphasize that these things are possible. And in this world and time, we don't want to deal with possibilities affecting our children. We want to make sure we, we do the most to make sure these things really don't even have a chance. Okay. So take those warnings very seriously, please. Um, keeping your kids. Now, something you can do is now take the time to organize your time with your family and your day. My wife did something very interesting. She took our youngest and she created a time slot for exercise where she would exercise with our youngest um, together in the house during a certain point in time. So you don't have to go outside to exercise all the time. You can go upstairs into the basement. Listen, remember the old videos uh, and things where dads would be doing push ups on the floor and the little ones would be lying on top of dad and it's a very cute picture and that kind of a thing. Um, but there's the group involvement of exercise, and it's also a great bonding process. Mm -hmm. So yes, keep those warnings very serious. Use the time to develop creative sources, even dancing. You've seen the videos of, of older dads and daughters dancing to various songs. It's a great time to, sit, to simply get down there and, and dance with your kids. Okay? It, there are many ways to, to work this to the advantage of the family, as opposed to looking at it as a disadvantage. My uh, teenage daughter um, has already threatened to teach uh, her almost 90-year-old grandmother and her mother uh, a couple of dances, and then they're going to start sharing those via social media. So uh, <laughs> the whole TikTok thing that I still don't get, but... Um, but there's, and, and we're seeing a lot of that happening. So uh, you're right, Dr. Mintz, lots of fun opportunities to, to do bonding exercises that we might not think of otherwise. Yes, absolutely. Those are wonderful tips. So uh, we've got a question from Puerto Rico, uh, which is great to know that we're, that we're reaching folks uh, all over both uh, all over the world, not just here in the, in the continental U.S. Um, but they're asking specifically about feedback on taking, and I'm, I'm going to demonstrate my ignorance here. Um, there's a specific um, element or a specific nutrient that's uh, being asked about or specific food, and I can't say it, um, but it's spelled S-H-I-L, a-J-I-T, so I'm guessing that's uh, shilajit or something like that to boost immune system. Yeah, that's an herb. <clears throat> okay. I, I would be careful with things like that, to be honest with you. Uh, we don't know how people are going to respond. We don't know, you know, inf inflammatory processes within each individual's system. Um, yeah, I'm, per I'm pretty familiar with that herb, and I would just caution you to be careful with something like that during this time. Very good. Absolutely. Okay, we've got someone who's asking specifically about the role of uh, neuroepinephrine in motility, especially for someone who is undermethylated. So this is one, one, one of our well-educated uh, viewers here. Uh, Dr. Dr. Mensa, <laughs> <laughs> you want to take that Again. one away? Take, that, take it away. <laughs> Again, when we talk about fight or flight, let's make this very simple. You know, we spend so much time in medicine and, and nutrition with very complicated constructs, but let's make it really simple. Again, my, my analogy is always about what's happening with fight or flight. What is it really intended for? Dangerous situations. So last time I used the bear in the woods. Well, let's make it the lion, you know, on the plains of the African continent. Okay. So uh, if you're being chased by the lion, you don't need digestion. You need to run. You need to flee. That's where the norepinephrine is kicking in and your heart is going and pumping and everything. And, and blood moves away from your stomach, okay? So if you are in stress mode and that norepinephrine is again elevated, your digestive processes are not being properly supported. Motility actually decreases. And this becomes a very, very big issue because your body now starts to fight. It's struggling because it thinks it's supposed to be in survival mode on the one hand, yet you're telling it to go ahead and digest food. You know, when you go swimming, everyone tells you, well, look, don't eat and then go swimming within 45 minutes. What are they basically saying? Swimming involves activity where norepinephrine is necessary, and it can create not just cramping, but literally all sorts of other challenges that can be very devastating and difficult. So 
When you look at norepinephrine, just consider that norepinephrine and digestion don't go together very well. When you see formal dinners on television or in the movies, and you see um, 18th century individuals all sitting at a big giant table, or you see um, the uh, wealthy elite at a wonderful dinner, what kind of music is actually being played? It's typically not hard rock, because that gets you going. It's classical music, and it's Bach and Beethoven and all these wonderful composers that play mellow, relaxing tones to help with the digestion. So there's real validity to this, okay? Mm -hmm. Real validity. Norepinephrine can be a big inhibitor. Stress is a big problem. That breathing exercise Samantha gave, wonderful, I, I kind of shared with you, it actually does the opposite. It brings the parasympathetic system into play, which tones down norepinephrine pathways and allows better digestion. Samantha, commentary? Yeah, I, yeah, thank you, Dr. Mensa. I just, I, you know, we, as humans, you know, we can handle a lot and we can push ourselves uh, to some pretty extremes, but we don't often realize the role that stress has in our lives and it's something that I'm constantly talking about when I'm working with people one-on-one, -on -one, the role of stress, um, because it's not this tangible, like this food on our plate in front of us. We can't see it, but we sure can feel it. Um, I think if we're going to have the discussion about norepinephrine and dopamine, we got to look at our copper toxic people, especially a lot of our females because of the role between copper and estrogen. We kind of touched on that before. Um, and we see a lot of digestive challenges uh, within that construct. I think, um, you know, Dr. Mensa, you called that copper dysmotility, which I think is so apt for what we're seeing with a lot of these biochemical uh, imbalances that, that we work with. So, um, so I just, again, wanna encourage all of you, and there's so much out there, and that alone is stressful. Uh, do this meditation, do that. Um, here, here's another thing. Let's just slow down, try the breathing exercise. It's so simple, it's so easy. It's gonna put you in that rest and digest capacity of the parasympathetic. Um, and, you know, just take stock of the stressors in your life. I mean, a simple journaling exercise where you kind of write down the things that really feel like triggers to you in your life, that alone can just start the healing process. So it really can be um, that, that simple to start the journey. So thank you, Dr. Mensa. And a reminder, you know, our children with autism, the vast majority of children with autism, more than 97% are copper toxic. Yes. Males and females. So they are constantly on adrenaline. That's why you see them always moving up, up and about. And you, you're, 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 the frustrations, you can't get them settled down to sit, let alone eat. They'll take a bite of something and then they're moving again. Okay, They're already in fight or flight stress mode. It doesn't help when we now feed them the wrong things to add to that. Okay, So let's not forget that. They're constantly being pushed biochemically to be on adrenaline okay? and physiologically. And our ADHD kids and, um, mm -hmm. you know, all, all of the behavioral, the full spectrum, I think, uh, Dr. Mensa, behavioral disorders as well, um, where, where we need to make sure that we're looking at copper and, and also pyrrole disorder um, and, and the role that that's playing in digestion as well. Mm -hmm. So we're, um, we've only got a couple more questions that folks have submitted, but we do still have time. So if you've got a couple of last minute questions, do get them in via the Q&A portal. Uh, but, but the one that, that just popped up actually is very much in keeping with where this conversation uh, just left off. Um, questions specific to parents of autistic children who uh, whose children are on specialized diets and they're paying attention to what you were saying about uh, ibuprofen versus Tylenol and the like, but they're asking what are some specific things that perhaps we can consider diet from a dietary standpoint when we've already got our kids on specialized diets trying to overcome uh, challenges that, that may be wrought by, by, uh, by their treatment for autism. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I think, uh, I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is, uh, have you been tested? Do we, you know, do, do we know really what your child's chemistry is? Right. Um, without that information, it's hard for me to give, I think, specific dietary guidance. But if we had that information and we know 
as we know with most autistic children, that there's a copper issue, as Dr. Mintz has shared, along with undermethylation and all this oxidative stress in the gut. We need to be really careful with sugars and starches, even in the natural uh, you know, world like maple syrup and things like that. We need to be mindful of things that are going to trigger yeast and bacteria in the gut. Um, and we need to focus more on our protein foods, our animal protein foods, um, and also our good fats, things like, um, uh, you know, coconut oil, if your child can tolerate it. Um, I've mentioned flax, I think, in every episode that we've had thus far. And flax is safe. Um, it's not high in copper. It makes great crackers. Um, and I, you know, I have some recipes where you can make like a, I call it my autism or my ASD patty. And it's basically a protein packed patty using flax meal. So we're not getting the copper from the nuts and seeds or the other nuts and seeds. And it's just a mixture of low folate veggies, uh, you know, ground chicken or turkey and some flax meal. Um, and I, you know, I usually, usually there are issues with eggs with my ASD kids, so I leave them out. Um, so really focusing in those areas, I think are, are, are going to serve you in the best way. So I hope that's helpful, you know, aside from not seeing any lab work or anything like that, so I can really give specific guidance. Now, one of the things that I would add to that is when you're looking at certain foods, now it depends on the food, of course, but look at your foods that are rich in zinc for example, okay? Mm -hmm. Zinc-rich foods are a wonderful dietary way to kind of help support the immune system, kind of help to, to support a lot of different uh, areas everywhere from lung function and capacity to gastrointestinal capacity. And we also want to now feed the right microbes. You know, Samantha, we talked before um, about prebiotics and probiotics, mm -hmm. you know, and what we didn't really get into is how these things not just create uh, food for um, the, the, the GI tract creatures that are in there, the microbes, but microbes also produce neurotransmitters. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it's interesting. Oh my gosh, you're so, we could go so far with this conversation because, um, you know, the, the bugs in our gut, as I like to say them, my kids always laugh when I say that, like, oh yeah, you've got these little critters in your gut and they give you your immune system. They secrete things like neurotransmitters and hormones and and you know when things kind of get out of control they're notorious for taking up and absorbing nutrients instead of allowing us to absorb those nutrients so so that's kind of where that imbalance comes into play um getting back to what you said dr mensa about zinc uh, i want to caution people because i know you'll go on dr google and you'll you know you'll you'll google high zinc foods um, oysters are going to come up as that number one food. Uh, I do not recommend oysters. I do not recommend sh uh, shellfish. You'll want to stick with beef and lamb as uh, you know your, your higher zinc foods. I mentioned before that they are the most bioavailable sources of zinc. And when we feed our bodies these bioavailable sources of, of, of these micronutrients, then we're also supporting that microbiota in our GI tract and helping to, to balance that. Now, there are a lot of things that, I mean, you know, again, it depends on the individual and how we approach therapeutically treating the GI tract and the oxidative stress in the GI tract. But I just want to encourage you that, especially for children, those protein foods, and again, protein is there's an absorption factor that occurs with animal proteins that is not present with plant-based proteins um, that's really critical for growth and development, especially the development of the healthy brain. And we need those to, um, to support what's going on micro uh, within the microbiota of our GI tract. Uh, so I hope that's helpful. I hope that makes sense. Um, was there a second part to that question? I, I'm sorry. I, I, I hope I... Uh, answer that question in full no i i think you i think you covered it pretty well there um we've got another question here though that is kind of an interesting twist on on this conversation um we've been talking so much about um about our young people about our children uh, particularly those with autism right now uh, or, or or during this session and i've got someone asking about um what about adults with autism? Um, you know, 
are there differences in the way that we approach um, adults who are dealing with aut autism and also uh, adults who might be on antidepressants um, and and dealing with the imbalances that might be caused there and are there some dietary things we can do that are specific to adults dealing with these uh, these two concerns there are uh, I think what we'll do is we'll look at the adults with autism because in our next segment uh, next week we're going to be talking about more of the adult population and uh, in particular seniors as well. Um, you know, when we're, we're dealing with adults with autism diet, actually, Samantha, when we're talking about diet in autism, why don't we go there with, with the adults? What do you find your clients are, are doing or where are the challenges there? Yeah, I, I, that's a great question because we, we actually do have a lot of uh, adult patients with autism and, um, Many are, you know, brilliant and very high functioning, but again, have a lot of uh, GI issues that have, you know, kind of, you know, since birth, which is what we, we see so, so commonly. So I, again, would encourage focusing on uh, those protein foods, those foods that are nutrient dense. Um, I mentioned beef and lamb, chicken and turkey are also good. Um, you know, again, without knowing chemistry specifically, uh, it, it is kind of a little bit harder to give guidance, but I would, you know, I, I would always encourage, you know, going more in that, in that realm with your healthy fats that I mentioned, um, your animal proteins and making sure that you're getting kind of that rainbow of phytonutrients from your, your plant foods. One thing that I notice. Um, you know, and I'm not against salads. Don't get me get me wrong. I, I love a good salad, um, but raw fruits, excuse me, raw vegetables tend to be extremely hard to digest in many of our patients. And if something is hard to digest and it's not moving through the GI tract the way that it should, um, and often coming out still in its whole state in the stool. Um, we can help remedy that with making sure that things are fully cooked. We can also add digestive enzymes into the mix uh, to help facilitate the, the breakdown of foods through the GI tract and especially um, in the stomach, where, which is where proteins are digested. Um, so don't be afraid to utilize some of those things to assist with the absorption of a lot of foods and also blending foods, pre-digest them and allows your body to you know, absorb things better, the micronutrients better. Um, and also it takes the load off of digestion. And as Dr. Minson mentioned, digestion is really, um, it takes a lot of energy for your body to digest food, especially fats and proteins because those take the longest. Um, and we can uh, help with, um, with that burden with foods that are pre-digested which would be uh you know soups and blended foods you could do you know some cooked veggies and blend those and make like a soup out of that or or even protein shakes um, those can be um uh you know much more easier to digest than than whole foods so i think the, those tips are probably going to be best for now until we're able to work with you uh one on one and if you are, um, in terms of behavior right now, anyway, with the older population of autism, you know, keep in mind that those natural, those, those agents that we use, like inositol, like GABA, GABA max is another one that we talk about, um, or L-theanine, that oftentimes very good agents to help with calming, okay? Um, behavior is a big problem when you've got, you know, a six foot two, 250 pound autistic young man um, but that can, those are little things that can help around with, with those kinds of things. And I know some of you are asking, what about the dosage? So today I'm going to tell you about dosage, you know, just for anybody, you know, for these larger kids, as we want to call them, you know, anacetol comes in a 650 milligram capsule. It also comes in a powder, but if it comes in a, a capsule at 650 milligrams, you can give one to three capsules up to three times a day just for calming purposes. GABA Max, it's not just GABA, it's got a combination of things in there, but GABA Max works very well with the big ones. That's how I got introduced to it, by the way. A young man in, uh, came into our clinic being chased by his dad, 
And I didn't realize what was going on. The dad was actually trying to corral the young man and settle him down. This kid actually would swim at the school very fast and was a football player, autistic, okay? Well, we had never tried Gabamax before. I saw him, I said, all right, I told our, our person, I said, okay, give him some Gabamax, half a teaspoon. This young man settled down very quickly. I was amazed. That's when I became a fan of Gabamax, okay? So child, adult, autistic or not, if you're stressed, Gabamax is something you can look at. For adults, it's half a teaspoon, up to twice a day. For children, now this is dependent upon weight, but for children, you generally want to go more with like a third of a teaspoon, twice a day. That's above 40 or 50 pounds, okay? L-theanine, a wonderful product, works mostly for overmethylated people, but it can work for anybody. Um, once again, anywhere between 50 milligrams for children, up to 200 milligrams for adults, twice a day, okay? just to help with the calming. So mom, you're stressed out, it's been a day, your husband's bugging you, the kids have been around, your job is bothering you, you want to take that Calgon bath, but you can't get away because they keep coming to the bathroom. <sighs> Go to the bathroom, take some inositol, live life with Vita Loca. Okay, <laughs> handle the rest of the day. Very good, very good. Um, and specific, the, the, uh, the second part of that question, uh, spoke or asked specifically about antidepressants. Refresh, please. What, what about antidepressants? Just are there dieting and are there dieting concerns that we should be thinking about if we're on antidepress if we're on antidepressants? Um, are there uh, things that we might be able to do to help get off of those antidepressants? Uh, those types of questions are what's popping up here. Well, th that's a very interesting question. And really what comes to play is it depends on what your chemistry is. You remember, um, psychiatry and pharmacology are rooted in symptoms and treatment. So if you've got the symptom of anxiety, the symptom of depression, you're going to get an SSRI or a, or a typical antipsychotic or whatever have you. They're not rooted in chemistry. Now, fortunately, most people tend to be undermethylated who have these conditions. So with undermethylation, as Samantha said earlier, you have low levels of serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine. And so when you take an SSRI, in general, statistically, people are going to do better. They're going to have elevated mood. But here's what's interesting, and I'm, I'm glad you asked this question because even I hadn't really thought about it that much. Because I usually think about methylation and guiding diet. Well, if you're on an SSRI um, for mood disorder, and you're trying to elevate your serotonin, you really may not want to be eating a diet high in vegetables. Not folate rich vegetables. I mean, you can eat lots of other vegetables, but you may want to watch the folate concentration because that could actually work against the SSRI because statistically you're likely to be an methylated person, okay? But the other side is true. Now let's talk about those people that we don't talk about too much. Folks who are not doing well They've tried 30 or 40 different medications pharmacologically, and none of them do well. And that's more often because they're actually overmethylated people. Now, for them, you know, if the sky's the limit on vegetables, eat those fully rich foods. That can actually help you do better and feel better. And yes, there are some people, when they change their diet in those directions based upon their chemistry, they don't need medication anymore. A good, rich diet in the right foods, we're not talking about the the pastas and the burger people and the pizza people. We're talking about just folks who, who are eating cleanly and who happen to be eating in a balanced fashion for their diet or for their chemistry. Oftentimes, diet can help really correct and at least wean individuals down to the lowest effective dose of medication if they're not able to get off totally. But most of the time, they do still need therapeutic intervention with you know, a, a nutrient program of some type. Dr. Mensa, I'm very appreciative of the fact that you pointed to yourself when you mentioned pizza eaters. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not shy about telling that's my weakness, it's been my weakness, and I mess myself up and make my family very irritable. Um, but they know it, I know it, and you know, what can I say? We're all human, right? And, um, and, we are human. And, and, and that was exactly my point, that, uh, that even those of us who know better, we, we're all human, and so it's okay to mess up a little bit every now and then. We just have to get yeah. back on point. Correct. Yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not a perfect eater. I'm not a perfect eater all the time. So I just, I, you know, again, I, 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 I tell everyone I work with, 
gosh, you're human. Please give yourself some slack. You know, you're being really hard on yourself. One thing I'd like to add to what Dr. Menz has said about medications is that generally over time they have boomerang effects. We call them boomerang effects, um, you know, side effects that, that, you know, continue to create even more sensitivity and it's a, it's a list. So um, I, I always want people to be mindful of the fact that d despite whether you're over or under methylated, um, over time, there can be side effects that, you know, that are, that are really um, nasty and, and, and comfortable. Um, and just, you know, just to be mindful of. With regard to over methylators, um, one thing that, uh, I, you know, I always want to stress is, yes, you want a high folate diet, more of a plant-based diet, but please keep in mind that protein should be lower than like myself who is under methylated you know i kind of shared with you my little vegan story again not that i think that you know veganism is bad or plant-based diets are bad but it just was not the right diet for me and my chemistry I, I definitely need more protein at every meal an under methylated person which they tend to gravitate toward more protein um it's all it's interesting how that works it, you know each each biotype wants to go the you know the opposite way with their diet we see that a lot um, you know, they actually need less, less protein to feel better, you know, cognitively, you know, because that's, that's, you know, but, but of course that trickles down into, uh, the physiology and, and, and what the body is doing as well. So just, um, wanted to add to that. Well, you know, one, one more interesting piece there. Here's the, the truth around inflammatory foods. With inflammatory foods, it doesn't matter what your chemistry is. You feel bad. Yeah. Your system does poorly. There is no chemistry that's immune to, to, to an ongoing onslaught of these horrific foods. That's how, in, in many respects, things like colon cancer, GI cancer, um, a variety of cancers actually are considered to be evolving from inflammation in the system due to a lifetime of just eating poorly. So what do we think we're doing in the interim at a time when we need to be protecting ourselves and giving ourselves as much protective immunity as possible, you know, we cannot ignore our diet. We simply cannot. We cannot ignore our GI tract. It's a great time to reconsider, purge, and regrow balance in our systems. Absolutely. Yeah, it's an excellent time. Very good. Very good. Well, we've been going now for about an hour and 15 minutes, and, and that seems to be the, uh, the extent of questions that we've got lined up for today. So glad that we were able to get to everyone's questions. Uh, would the two of you share a little bit about your plans for next week, the, the fourth in our series of four uh, webinars? I know that you, Dr. Mensa, you had mentioned earlier that we were gonna talk about um, some of our older population and, and how mm -hmm. to address their immune health concerns. Well, before that, you know, because um, we do have a little bit of time we've allocated and Samantha and I had planned on talking about quite a bit. You know, our goal is to try to help inform as much as we can during these Perfect. segments. Samantha, there's some things we talked about that yesterday and, and before in terms of preparation that we weren't able to get to. Is there anything you'd like to address now before we actually prep for next week? Um, hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think one thing that I would really love to, uh, you know, again, just remind everyone is that despite the fact that this is a really trying time for all of us and we're all reading the data from the CDC we're all you know reading everything and seeing everything that's going on in this world um, you know fear fear is a good mobilizer into action uh, so I, I, I want to encourage everyone to think of fear as something that can propel you and help move you forward help you change your family in a new way rethink retool um, revisit uh, things that may not be, you know, working so great and, and how that can be kind of a rebirth for you. Um, I think that's my main, that, that was my main goal in wanting to, to talk about our kids today because they are so precious and we're just seeing so much dysregulation within our young people. And um, it's just, it, it, it breaks my heart. And I, I just, I have such a heart for, I don't have children of my own, but I have a big heart for kids. So um, I hope, if anything, you, you can take away some nuggets um, of what we've shared today. And then, um, uh, I don't know if you want to add to, that, add to that, Dr. Mensa, but we can also 
if you want me to go into kind of our elderly population, how would you? No, we'll, we'll save that one for next time. Okay. We'll <laughs> I mean, what we'll talk about next time. Yeah. I think, um, you know, sitting back as a, as a parent and I look at how um, my baby, I always call her my baby, she's the last one, um, has been reacting to this whole thing. You know, she's in middle school. And, you know, for a while, she did not want anyone to leave the house at all. You know, our children are not just mindless little beings. They pick up on the fear, the stress in the environment. And this is where we, too, have to settle down to be bigger than ourselves in our own reactions and take our time to sit down and talk to our kids about what's happening, um, what it really means, reassurance. You know, the most wonderful thing about being that, that mom, that dad, is that Folks, let's not forget, your kids look up to you like no one else in the galaxy. No one else. They're looking to you for reassurance. They're looking to you for protection. They're looking to you for guidance. And at this point, you've got to sit down and spend a little bit of time and say, you know, hey, don't worry. For the most part, things are going to be okay. Limit their exposure. Okay, limit their exposure to what is happening on television. Okay, some of those things they're not really able to process. When we see pictures of, of truckloads of, of, of people being put into a vehicle and then being dumped in a landfill in China or somewhere else for that matter, and these are bodies to be burned, that's not something you want your kids to watch. Okay, that starts to happen, please send them out of the room. But take your time to be loving with your kids. You know, they need your physical presence, they need your emotional state, and no matter how you're feeling, you take a breath, do Samantha's, uh, 14 second uh, breathing technique, approach your child, put them on your lap, something you haven't done in a while maybe, and just talk, tickle, have fun, share, reassure them. This is home. Dad is here, mom is here, maybe both are there, and it's gonna be okay. And we're gonna get through this, we're gonna get through it together. Love is the most powerful thing you can possibly imagine, and I'm not just being trite, I do mean it. This is what your children feed off of. So let's look at them as vulnerable people that we're here to protect, as well as those little beings that we chase around all day long, okay? And let's build that foundation of warmth and caring and sharing. Yes, oh, wonderfully said. Grace. Yes. Grace, grace for each other, grace for all of us, adults too, online specifically. Um, yeah. Absolutely, it's absolutely. So can you, so now let's move into what can folks uh, expect to hear from us next week? Dr. Mensa, did you want me to kind of give a little, or do you want Please. to? No, you go ahead. Ladies um, first. <laughs> thank you. So as, as Dr. Mensa shared, we're going to focus on the elderly next week. We're going to focus more on the adult population. Um, one, one interesting conversation that, that we had when we were preparing is how we're seeing a pretty severe zinc deficiency in our elderly population, which explains a lack of taste for food, a loss of appetite, things like that. So we wanna speak into supporting the elderly, supporting those people that are, um, have, have a higher level of susceptibility to the virus and, and what um, they can do to be supporting their immune system. So, you know, whether it's, you know, diabetes or hypertension or, um, you know, cardio metabolic, uh, we want to be able to speak into all those issues. So please be thinking about what you'd like to ask us. Uh, you can always send us a message and um, you, can, you can send me a message personally on either my Facebook or Instagram pages and, and I'll make sure and include your question in uh, next week's episode. Dr. Mensa, anything you want to add to that? Nope. <laughs> well, then, Dr. Mensa, I will ask you this. We'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the fact that um, we're also looking at doing some other webinars, including one tomorrow, uh, that deals not specifically with nutrition, but, but more with just the, the psychological elements of, uh, of dealing with this COVID pandemic. Did you want to talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. So we're going to have a, a little mini series um, with some wonderful therapists to help us navigate the mind. You, you've heard me say so much about 
issues that really we've considered mental issues, issues of, of the mind, when they're really issues of the brain or the GI tract or some kind of imbalance. Now we're actually going to talk about the mind. The mind as it relates to how we navigate these waters on a more conscious and even unconscious or subconscious level. And so uh, tomorrow, and we're going to have this conversation um, with a, a wonderful gentleman, and we're going to be looking to do another series involving both body with Samantha and mind, and then eventually we're going to bring all this together and have a, a whole network of folks for you to be able to talk to and to hear on different seminars. So this is our, our sort of our introduction to, gosh, what's coming tomorrow will be very useful in terms of practical things you can do, like the exercises that Samantha gave you. Um, lovely little organizational pieces and different dynamics and exposures that you can utilize starting tomorrow with your own family to try to make life a little bit less stressful for you. Very good. Thank you so much, Dr. Mensa. And and again, that webinar tomorrow will be same time, but tomorrow. So uh, four o'clock uh, central, that's two o'clock on the West Coast, five o'clock on the East Coast. Um, if you go to the Mensa Medical Facebook page, you should be able to find announcements that include the link for you to join that free event as well. Uh, thanks to both Dr. Mensa and to Samantha Gilbert for uh, your wonderful insights that you've shared today. Thanks to all of you who have tuned in. Um, as has been the case uh, with our last two events, we're going to put this up uh, as a video replay uh, on YouTube, and there'll be links to it from the Mensa Medical Facebook page. And I know, uh, Samantha, you've got it. You've got links to this on your website as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so please encourage folks that weren't able to join us today to take a look as well. And if there's information that you want to recapture that you perhaps didn't get a chance to write down during the broadcast, you can always go back and find it there. We'll have the, those links up later on this evening. Again, thanks for joining us and uh, we will see you tomorrow and again next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.